I know it's ridiculous. I know. Okay, we're recording. Yes, we're recording. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good evening. It is December eleventh, two thousand twenty-three, and this is a very special meeting of the town council because we're welcoming our new councilors here for orientation. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. But I do want to point out at this point, we have a pretty full house. Uh, this meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Am Amherst Media Channel 9 and through their live stream. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, the seated council, I'm calling the December 11th, 2023 special town council meeting to order at 631. I'll call upon each councilor by name at that time, please unmute and say present. This indicates that we can hear you and you can hear us. Um, there are some people who will be joining us later. Uh, and I believe Shalini Bellmiller is one of those. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gother is on her way. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johannick. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller is not here yet. Dorothy Pam is not here yet. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane is not here yet. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. And Alicia Walker is not here yet. I would also like to make sure that the incoming counselors can be heard and we can hear, uh, they can hear us. Uh, Freke. Etta. Here. Bob Hegner. Present. Or Robert Hegner. Holla Lord. Present. George Ryan. Present. Thank you. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And to make a comment, please use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of using remote participation, we'll address it at the time. Um, there is no public comment tonight. I'll be reiterating that when we go into the rest of the meeting. Uh, the agenda does include our orientation and then various other action items, as well as an executive session of the town council. So with Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. And thank you, Pat. If you keep monitoring, that's great. Um, okay, with that, I'm turning this over to Athena O'Keefe, who is our very able and wonderful clerk of the town council. And she is going to uh, conduct the orientation. Thank you, Lynn. Nope, that's just mail for counselors. Thanks. Welcome everybody. Um, so like Lynn said, we're doing the orientation tonight. I'm really excited to be Eat meeting. More into your mic. Okay. Thank I'm you. excited to be meeting with all of you um, and meet some of you face-to-face -face for the first time. Uh, so let's get right into it because we have a little bit less time than I had originally anticipated. Um, like Lynn mentioned, there's no public comment at this meeting, but public comments can be submitted online. Written comments online are received by all counselors and we publish them on the website. And if there were anyone in person, they could use this QR code to submit their comments. So quickly, I wanna do some introductions. Um, my name is Athena, I'm your council clerk. You all know Paul Bachelman, the town manager. That's about as much as he's gonna do to me for this orientation. <laughs> um, but. I wanna say, and I'll reiterate this again and again, Paul and I are gonna be available to meet with you individually if you have follow-up questions. I'm gonna go through everything fairly quickly tonight as just kind of getting a lay of the land. And then if you have questions for me and Paul, like I said, you can set up a meeting. There was a, an option to set up a meeting in that form that I sent, but an email works too, and we'll find a time to meet with you. Um, so quickly, um, I wanna say the very first thing is The button on your mic, you need to push so the green light is on if you wanna use your microphone. Um, so make sure the green light is on if you have a question. Um, we have a lot to cover tonight, but please stop me. Just um, raise your hand or speak up if you have a question. 
Um, like I said, I want to give a good overview of everything, but I, I think it's really helpful. If you have a question, then I may have gone too fast for other people too. So I think it's a good idea to stop and address questions as they come up rather than wait until the end. So please stop me. Um, the first thing we're going to do is announcements. We have the swearing-in cer ceremony for new counselors at the Bangs Community Center on Tuesday, January 2nd. We'll have a photographer available so that counselors can take their portraits. Um, so if you wanna wear something fancy, please go ahead. Or not. Um, then we have the regular, the first regular council meeting will be January 8th. Um, the Massachusetts Municipal Conference is January 1920. Paul sent you information about that. If you have questions, please reach out. It's a really great opportunity to meet some colleagues, um, get some information. There's some really informative and useful breakout sessions um, and it's a time for networking. It's, it's a really great opportunity for us. So um, if you have questions, like I said, email me or Paul and uh, get in touch with me or Angela if you'd like to register. So we're gonna do a really quick 30 second exercise. I'm setting a timer so we know. Um, so we did a little bit of appreciative inquiry in the last council retreat. I think it's really nice to kind of set the tone, especially because you're all sitting here together in, a, in the same room for the first time. Um, so we're just gonna do this little quick appreciative inquiry exercise. And all that means is we're gonna reflect on the times that we have felt really effective and engaged and how we can bring the circumstances around that into our future work. So for 30 seconds, just think about when you felt engaged and valued, when you felt like you were doing really well, everything was working, all those aha moments were happening. And I'm gonna set a timer for 30 seconds. Think about what factors supported those moments and how can we bring that into this next two years together? All right. So let's go around the room very quickly and everyone, the first, just one word to summarize what came up for you that you're gonna bring into this next council term. Fricka? No judgment. Anna? Taking action. Right, those were two words, you guys. Fricka did two words, I followed <laughs> this. I'm taking the action to expand it to two words. And I'm just <laughs> Thanks. Bob? Um, this is two words, but hurricane recovery. Okay. Commitment. Nice. Um, I would say discussion. I'm not bringing it, but I would recommend what came to me was curiosity. Information. Listening. Focused. Assumptions. Excuse me. Assumptions. Better listening. Collaboration. Wonderful. Just think about what you're all bringing into the room tonight. And I, I feel like this is so powerful to hear all this from each other. I feel like this is a great foot to start our time together tonight. Oh, I'm so sorry, Alicia, please Thank share you. with us what word came up for you. Yeah, no problem. Mine was also going to be collaboration, um, but maybe sharing. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you, Lynn, for reminding me that Alicia's online. Alicia, I'll, I, I try, I'll try not to forget about you. <laughs> okay, we're going to get right into it with laws, rules, and policies. So just quickly, I like I said, I'm going to go rather quickly through these slides, but jump in if you have questions. So we have federal laws that govern the whole United States. We have state laws that govern Massachusetts. 
our local charter governs us here in Amherst and the council rules tell us how we're gonna run our meetings and so on. Um, we can't have a council rule that contradicts with a federal rule. So this is the order of precedence. Our charter couldn't conflict with state law, a state law couldn't conflict with federal law. So sometimes there are state laws that aren't specifically um, listed in the charter, but we need to follow the state law. Um, one thing that comes up right away is that there's a certain procedure for adopting zoning changes. We have to follow that state law. It's not laid out in the charter, but just so that you're aware that there are laws that take precedence over the charter that aren't specifically laid out in the charter. I have a stack of printed copies of our charter. If you'd like a printed copy, they're right here. I highly recommend you read it, especially Article 2 and Article 5. Article 2 is the about your role as legislators and Article 5 is financial procedures. Um, I come back to those sections again and again. I refer to the charter all the time. I usually have a tab on my computer open all the time with council's rules and another one of the charter. That's just, because it's their great references. They um, talk about your powers and duties, talk about his powers and duties. There are even some duties in there for me. I don't get any powers, but I do have <laughs> duties in there. <laughs> so some state laws that govern us I'm going to talk about and you'll get more information on all of these from the town clerk's office when you're sworn in and some of them you'll need to file a certificate or a receipt of these the open meeting law you need to sign a sign a uh, receipt saying that you've received it you understand the open meeting law the guide that you'll receive from the town clerk's office looks a little wordy but it's another one that we come back to again and again and again, and there are questions, and I encourage you to read it before you sign that receipt, saying that you understand it, and uh, bring any questions you have to me and Paul. Both the, all three, the open meeting law, the public records law, and the conflict of interest law, they're all intended to make um, the public, um, to, to make uh, the legislative process accessible to the public. So the open meeting law guarantees that the decisions and the discussion that happen at town council are held in a public way, that um, meetings are conducted with uh, public access and the decisions happen in view of the public. Um, so people are aware of the decision-making process. It requires that we post meetings 48 hours in advance, that meeting rooms are in an accessible location, that there's a quorum present when meetings are held, there are, right now, the open meeting law is a little bit different than exactly what's laid out in the guide because we have this virtual meeting access option that's still available to us. And my understanding is that the state legislature is working on making some of those provisions permanent. But right now, we're allowed to hold meetings virtually so everyone can be remote. Normally, we have to have a quorum in the room. Um, because of these virtual meeting procedures, we have to take all votes by roll call. So if you've been listening in at council meetings, Lynn's been saying everybody's name again and again in the past, all you had to do was raise your hand. Um, and then like we did at the beginning of this meeting, Lynn went through and made sure that everyone can hear and be heard. We don't have to do that when we're having fully in-person meetings. The public records law means that in the, as few words as I can, when you write anything down that has to do with council business, it's a public record. If you're keeping notes to yourself, that's not, if it's you know, um, not part of the public process, but if you're writing emails to constituents, if you're writing emails to each other, if you're writing emails to uh, me or Paul or anybody else that has to do with council business, that's a public record. Your text messages regarding council business are a public record. So anytime you're writing something, it's a public record and there could be a records request for those documents. Um, so it's good to be aware of what part of the open meeting law restricts those kinds of communications that you wanna be aware of because if there were a public records request that revealed that you were having deliberation outside of a meeting, then we could be held in violation of the open meeting law. So again, I encourage you to read that open meeting law guide and come and ask if you have questions. Um, Lynn, did someone join that you yeah. need to check? Um, I'm just looking real quick. I don't see anyone else. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, go ahead. Do you know if um somebody has texted, is every text on my phone discoverable with the public record or just the one between the town councilor or constituent and I? So your private messages wouldn't be, unless you were talking about town business, unless you were conducting councilor business in your text messages. Lynn, do we need to hold on so no. we can? We're okay, okay. Um, so the conflict of interest law, mm. there will be a, a training that you'll receive information from the town clerk's office. It's an online training. You'll have to provide the town clerk's office with a certificate that you've completed the training that you can print out at the end or save an email. Um, it's the duty of each council member to know the conflict of interest law. And if you think you have a conflict or there could be a perception that you have a conflict, you need to make sure that you file a disclosure with the town clerk's office and make that disclosure at a meeting. If you have a, a legitimate conflict of interest, then um, what you would want to do is recuse yourself from the meeting, which means you're actually leaving the meeting, you're not participating in the council discussion, and you're not participating in a vote. And that would only happen if you had a financial interest in something the council were to vote on, or if you had a family member with a financial interest. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but in as few words, again, as I can manage, that's what it's about. And you'll receive more information from the clerk's office. If you have questions about the conflict of interest law, the state ethics commission is really, really helpful. You can call them and they'll advise you and let you know if you have a true conflict of interest and what the best course of action is. Like I said, I have paper copies of the charter. I encourage you to read them. I encourage you to read the rules. Um, there's a long list of town policies that have already been adopted. Um, the council, aside from the council rules, there's a public ways policy. Uh, flags policy, comprehensive housing, surveillance use, uh, policy regarding recommendations for how council committees make appointments to the council for multiple member bodies. Um, if you don't know, we I think we have an impending vacancy as a non-voting non finance committee member coming up. Um, uh, there are, are also going to be appointments to the Charter Review Committee and the Zoning Board of Appeals coming up in the beginning of the year. So it might be handy to take a look at that policy on recommendations for council appointments so you understand the process. The Finance Committee and Charter Review Committee appointments will be recommended by the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. And the Zoning Board appointments will be coming from Community Resources Committee, but those are all voted by the full council. There's also a policy on electioneering and early voting a policy on publication of candidate statements, and an FAQ on resolutions, proclamations, citations, and commemorations. Um, the charter and the rules lay out the powers and duties of the president, the vice president, the town manager, and other elected officials. So it also talks about, the, the rules also talk about how the council is organized, how meetings are conducted, um, how the agendas are organized, what goes on the agenda, how the public participates in meetings, um, the council code of conduct, how to make motions, uh, the legislative process, voting requirements, uh, the council committees and statement of values. So again, read your rules and reach out if you have questions. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about meeting procedures and making motions in a moment. Um, and if you have questions, this is a, a much shorter version of what we did at the at the council retreat this past year. Um, and I have that longer presentation on motions and order precedents and so on. So if you'd like to see that, I can share it with you. The town manager rules and financial guidelines, I thought we were gonna have ready by tonight, but the council hasn't voted them yet. So uh, those will both be discussed later in the evening and councilors elect, you're welcome to stay and listen in as part of the audience in that conversation. <clears throat> and then we'll have them available to you once they're finalized. The drafts are in the packet for the meeting tonight. So generally, a motion is made to begin discussion on an action item. That's what kicks off the discussion. The discussion focuses on the motion that's in front of you. A secondary motion, if there is one, would then, uh, the, the conversation would then focus on the secondary motion and the vote on the secondary motion would take place before that original motion. So I'm gonna explain a little bit more of this in a moment. 
So for example, if there were a motion to adopt a resolution concerning overconsumption of chocolate by town councilors, this is, all of these are secondary motions, but only these ones, um, if a secondary motion, if a councilor decided that this really needs to be referred to the snacks committee before the council takes any action on this resolution, the motion to refer is down here. So the motions that would be in order while a motion to refer on the floor are above it. Does that make sense? <laughs> if, for example, the secondary motion were to amend the resolution, then a motion to refer would take precedence over that motion to amend. The mo motions, the secondary motions that have asterisks, those are not debatable. So there's no conversation. If someone makes a motion to adjourn the meeting and there's a second, you move directly to a vote. There's no conversation about it. This, with two asterisks, the previous question, um, that's asking the council to end the discussion and move directly to a vote. A motion to call the previous question does require a second, and it, it's not debatable, and it requires a two-thirds vote. Are there questions about this before we move on? <clears throat> So a couple of things that are in the rules that um, aren't very clearly defined are point of order and a question of privilege. So points of order are how the council holds itself and the president accountable for following the rules. So a counselor could call a point of order when there's a breach of the rules. You can call a point of order without being recognized by the president. You can interrupt a call a point of order. Um, say for example, there were a point of order about veering off topic. There's a motion on the floor to adopt that resolution about overconsumption of chocolate by counselors. And now someone's talking about potato chips and that's not the issue here. So uh, someone could call a point of order saying this is off topic. And the president might say, your point is well heard, please stay on topic. The motion on the floor is to adopt this resolution about eating too much chocolate. Question of privilege is generally, I don't know that anyone has ever called a question of privilege, but it's generally when something is happening in the room that's interfering with the proceedings. Um, we've got a piece of equipment in the room that's making a really loud noise and people can't hear, somebody's audio isn't working, someone is having some other problem, it's 100 degrees in here and we need to take care of that before the meeting can proceed. Most times a point of order and a question of privilege are addressed informally without a vote. If there were a disagreement about the president's decision um, on a point of order or question of privilege, then it could be made as a motion and then the council would vote on those. So I wanted to just briefly describe what it means to abstain. <clears throat> So as you'll see in the rules in the charter, some votes of the council require a majority and some which require a majority of the full council. So a majority and a majority of the full council, a majority of the council present and a more majority of the council present and voting mean different things. So I want to make it really clear what abstentions mean. An abstention is not voting. So if you're a present, then you're counted as a counselor present. If you're present and you abstain, then you're not counted as a counselor present and voting. So for example, it takes seven votes, seven yay votes to adopt a bylaw or to amend a, a bylaw, regardless of how many counselors are in the room, regardless of how many counselors are voting, you need seven yes votes to adopt or amend a bylaw. To adopt a proclamation, you need a majority of counselors present. So if seven counselors in the, are in the room, a proclamation could be adopted by a vote of four counselors. A vote to refer that proclamation to a committee requires a majority present and voting. So if there were seven counselors in the room and five counselors chose to abstain, that could pass with two counselors voting yes. Um, I do include on the motions sheet, which you'll see in the council packets. Um, and if you're not familiar with the motion sheet or how the packet works or anything like that, please reach out. Um, and I'm, I meant to say at the beginning, if any of these rules or policies or the charter or anything is hard to find for you on the council on the town website, please reach out and I can give you a quick tour. Um, I think we've done a very good job with 
our website, but sometimes things can be a little bit difficult to find, and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So in your council packet every night, every meeting night, there is a list of motions. Those motions aren't required. They're just the proposed motions that I put together with the help of uh, the town manager, the council president, and usually committee chairs include motions, or they're supposed to, according to the rules, include when they make a recommendation, the motion that they'd like the council to adopt. Um, so in the motion sheet, I include the quantum of a vote, how many votes are required to pass each motion. Um, like I said, if there were a true conflict of interest and a counselor needed to abstain from a vote because there were a conflict of interest, you wouldn't actually abstain. You would remove yourself from the discussion. And you would be absent for the vote. Communication pro protocols. Generally, we use email for housekeeping only. You're not having discussions. You're not expressing your thoughts, feelings, opinions to each other via email. Um, you'll see a lot of emails from me and Paul and Lynn with do not reply all in all capital letters and in bold um, because that's an open meeting law violation if you respond to an email with the full council copied expressing your thoughts, feeling opinion, and, and opinions about something that's in front of the council. So keep it to housekeeping. We're scheduling a meeting. We need to know if you're available, um, things like that. If you have a question about what is or isn't appropriate to put in an email, please reach out and I'm happy to help. Um, in terms of communication, the charter expressly prohibits counselors and the full council from directing any staff not appointed by the council. So the two people that you can boss around are sitting right here. Any other, any other staff, you need to contact the town manager. If you need to get in touch with staff, you have a question for staff, you need some, some more information that goes through the town manager. Which leads us to this organization chart. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is who appoints who, who elects who. Um, this is also in the, the printed charter booklet that's available here if you'd like it. Uh, the president, the vice president, council committees, and liaisons. <clears throat> like I mentioned, the charter and the rules lay out the powers and duties of the president and vice president. It also talks about the committees, what they do, um, the committee charges, which is essentially what the committee is there for, how many members it has, and so on. Those are all available online. It's a good idea to review those before the new year because after you elect a president and vice president in January, you'll have an opportunity to tell the president which committees you'd like to be a part of, if you'd like to be a liaison to any town committees. Um, so the president sets council agendas. Uh, the president appoints counselors to council committees. Um, the president will preside at meetings. There are some ceremonial duties. Um, the president acts as the council spokesperson, does the state of a town address, which the president and the manager will do later this evening. Um, and they facilitate communication between committees and the council. Um, I often help with that as well because I attend a lot of committee meetings. So if there's something that is voted on in committee, um, you know, someone needs to know in order to put that on the agenda and the president and I work together to do that. Aside from those things and the other powers and duties outlined in the charter and the rules, um, the council's vote is the same as any other counselors. And the vice president serves in the president's absence to do all of those things. <clears throat> there are some specific rules about referrals to committees and committee reports. It's wise to look at those um, to know um, how the process works if there's an automatic referral for an item so you know that it has been referred to committee. There's requirements that the president lets you know if something has been automatically referred to committee and so on. Uh, council liaisons to town committees are a link between the council and the committee. The liaison just does just that. It lets the council know what's going on in those committees. It doesn't, the liaison wouldn't participate in a conversation with the committee. They don't sit in the panel with the committee, they sit in the audience, they don't participate in the meeting unless there is a question directed to them about the council process. So liaison's not there to express opinions um, or um, commit the council to any course of action. Um, so my hope is to take care of your technology needs, um, help you complete your paperwork for human resources, 
and file all the paperwork you need with the town clerk's office before December 22nd. That's in two Fridays. Um, and with as few trips to town hall as possible. So after this meeting, I'll send you an email with all the information you need to schedule a time with IT, to pick up a town computer if you'd like a laptop to use, how to set up your town email, um, the paperwork that you'll need for HR to set you up as a town employee so that you can receive your compensation. Um, and then, like I said, those uh, conflict of interest, open meeting law and uh, public records law documents from the town clerk's office. So I don't expect everyone, like I urged you over and over again to read the rules and read the charter, but I absolutely don't expect you to, to remember everything. I have some other guidance documents and cheat sheets that I can share with you. I'm always available. Um, my door is open if you have questions about the charter or the rules. If there's something that I don't know, I won't tell you an answer until I'm absolutely sure that my answer is correct. And if I'm not sure, even if I double check, then I'll check with someone else to make sure that the information that I'm giving you is right. My role is totally unbiased. So even if I think what you're suggesting is a really bad idea, I'm still going to give you the best advice I can to achieve what you want to do. Um, I didn't get into the legislative process at all because I wanted to leave time for questions. And I know we have other things on the agenda, so I'm trying to keep it really brief. The rules speak to the legislative process, but if you have something that you would like to propose to the council for action, a new bylaw, a change in a bylaw, a resolution or a proclamation or anything else, I strongly encourage you to get in touch so that um, I can help you figure out what you need to do and what kind of documents you need and how to format the thing that you're trying to do into the format the council wants to see and so on. Um, and I think that's all. I think I actually got through all my notes. <laughs> If there's um, something that I didn't cover that you'd like me to cover more in depth, if you have questions about anything that I covered right now, like I said, please get in touch. If there's something you want me to go back to, nobody raised their hands, even though I blazed through that. Holla did. Questions? Yes. Can you please use your mic? The conflict of interest uh, training, if we took it before, do we have to take it at the beginning of every council It's session? on a two-year cycle. So I can check with the town clerk's office and see who is due or overdue to um, update their conflict of interest training. Thank you for that question, because we do it every two years. And, and I don't remember if it's on the same cycle as counselors. New counselors will have to complete the conflict of interest law training. We need to have that on file. Any other questions? Okay, <laughs> and we're done. No, no. <laughs> Go. So, um, one of the, in, in in addition to the conflict of interest training, um, cybersecurity is really a core element of the work that we do, and we work really hard. Um, and so, we encourage you. We'll, you'll be getting uh, invitations to participate in some cybersecurity training that we are doing for all of our staff. Um, and encourage you to do that. They're getting way more sophisticated and you will be have access to our town servers and things like that, or at least through email. And so we just ask you to participate in that. Be super careful. Um, new counselors will be given a device. If you so, if you request one, our IT department will reach out to you and offer that up to you and help train you on it. Please, Hala. Would it be recommended to um, take said device for the security might be up to what the town needs? I strongly urge you to, to take the town device. Um, like I mentioned with the public records law, all the documents that you produce, all your emails that have to do with town business are public records. And I find it so much easier to keep all of my town business on my town computer and not my personal computer so that I don't have to go through my personal emails. I don't have to go through my personal files. If there's a request for something that's on my computer, it keeps it all in one place and separate from your personal stuff, your campaign stuff. It's very clear what belongs with what. Um, it also makes it easier for IT to help you if you're having technical issues. IT can remote into your town device and troubleshoot a lot of things that if you're having a problem on your personal device, unfortunately, our IT department can't support everybody's personal computers. Um, so I do recommend doing that. Yeah. Mandy. <clears throat> 
So you talked about the charter restriction of we can only basically talk to Paul and you. Um, but I, I wanted Paul to elaborate on that, especially as it relates to council committees, because each committee is assigned a liaison. Um, and so, you know, I, I know what I've been doing, especially as chair, but I'd like Paul to elaborate, especially as it relates to the council committee liaisons who are staff members that are not only not always you, the two of you. I'm really I'm glad you brought that up as well. So yeah, so every council committee, every committee has a staff liaison of, of one person or another. So for instance, the finance committee has the comptroller or finance director. Uh, this CRC committee has the assistant town manager or planning director. Um, TSO has the town manager. But every there will always be a a staff liaison who's the primary purpose. When in addition to um, Athena, will help get meetings posted and things like that. So those conversations are just much more efficient to be had directly with that staff person, especially when they're figuring out what's coming up on the agenda. I do not need to be involved in those questions. Um, and I'm the staff liaison for GOL, even though Paul didn't mention it. <laughs> and the liaisons don't do things like post meetings or take minutes or post packets and things like that. I'll help with all of those things. Um, but the li liaisons are really helpful to liaise with Stown Taft. Stown Taft. <laughs> Tom Staff. There are other questions? Alicia, I didn't see your hand go up. If, if you have questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. And if not, Lynn, I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Athena. Thanks. Okay. I was going to suggest that um, the seated counselors that are with us tonight um, uh, might share one tidbit of some advice and learning from our first year, or our last five years, our last two years, whatever. And um, so without, so I want you to think about what that piece of advice might be. And um, let's start with Jennifer. You want to you want some time to think about it? Okay, I I would like the seated counselors that are here to share a piece of advice to the incoming counselors. Pearl of wisdom. Pearls of wisdom. Yes, there you go. Um, well, I think getting to know um other counselors, and I do think the MMA conference. So our first, the first year I was on, we were still in COVID, so we didn't have the conference. Right. And so I went, the first one I went was the second year, and I could see if I had gone the first year, really just three weeks into the council, it's a really um, great opportunity to get to know people. And again, we started during COVID, so we were remote, so it took us a while to get to know each other. And I think the next council will have the opportunity to do that right away. Pam? Thank you. Um, my suggestion with, is as you find out what uh, committees you're on um, to sort of think through what kind of um, files and, and organization you want of your computer. Um, you know, some people carry it from work and have sort of a basic structure of how they may uh, sort things out, but um, it never hurts to ask other people if they have some ideas about uh, organization of information. A lot of information comes in both as emails and as files. And um, dealing with those efficiently is a, is a good use of time. Pat. I have a little thing taped to my computer and it says, be calm like a giant tree in a storm. <laughs> so in order to be calm, I feel like I have to center myself. That means really reading the material in the packets, whether it's for a committee or for the council and you know, trying to understand what your initial reactions and assumptions are and have those, but be ready to listen. Um, I think you guys are going to do a great job. George, you're, you're, in, you're in a unique position. Do you have something you'd like to offer? Never tell the truth. 
I was hoping I would be passed over since uh, it's been so long, I can barely remember. Um, definitely talk to each other um, and get to know each other. Um, I think that's good advice. Okay, Andy. The, th the one thing that I would add is that a lot of things that we do in the council have annual cycles to them. And the annual cycles frequently have to do with uh, state law requirements and uh, what has to be done at what period of time. Some are created by the council itself or by our um, procedures. And uh, so it's important to get to understand that cycle and also to recognize that uh, at this point in time, you're not the first ones if you're a new counselor who's gone through those cycles. And uh, the uh, SharePoint, which uh, hasn't really been talked about yet, is a resource to find out what was done with a particular item in that cycle previously. Um, Anna. Don't worry. Just well, I know that. I'll come back. We're we're not doing you get right. to go last right now. You no, have to I'll, go now. I'll go. <laughs> Can I go twice? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about district meetings. Okay. Um if you're a district counselor and all of you that were elected are district counselors, um, the general practice, although it's not required, is that the counselors for that district hold the meeting together and periodically um, and to the extent that it's possible, they invite the at-large counselors to also come. Um, those meetings have been in a variety of in-person and then obviously, um, on, on Zoom and different counselors have chosen to um, post those meetings in different ways, sometimes using their own uh, Zoom links and sometimes using the town's Zoom links. It's also very common if there's a hot issue that a general presentation, for instance, might be prepared and then made at those district meetings. For, instance, for example, when we were doing the elementary school and getting ready for that, Kathy, I think you went to every district meeting. Where are you, Kathy? She's not here yet. Okay. Oh, hi, Kathy. Um, and so Kathy, <laughs> right, Kathy went to every district meeting and did a presentation so that people could ask questions specifically in that district meeting. I know, Paul, you've been to many district meetings and we've had other people depending on the issue. Um, in sometimes issues will arise specifically for your district. And sometimes that means some staff would be more relevant to be at your district or not district meeting. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about district meetings. Oh, you have to have two a year. That's required by the charter and- um, Read the charter. Huh? <laughs> Read the charter. Read the charter, right. Um, and um, that's uh, all I'm going to say about district meetings for the moment. Anika. Okay, so I will second read the charter and take a use a town device. Um, other than that, I would uh, I would recommend I'll stay with my curiosity, remain curious. Um, I believe what one of um, the best pieces of advice I think I received as a young person and try to think about that all the time is experts are curious. And um, if you or if someone could tell me something that I learn more, makes me a better person, by all means, bring it on. Um, you'll be with 12 other very dynamic personalities. Um, and that's a great thing. And so I think it's really important to remember that there's no headline or paper or blog that would ever tell you what makes someone tick if you've never had a conversation with them. So I think it's it's just really important to have individual conversations, get to know everyone, um, and and yeah, collaborate and remain curious. Okay, Mandy Jones. Taking up that theme, I was going to say 
ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, some of us that have been on the council five years with that annual cycle of things that come up, start knowing what come up and we hear the same presentation over and over. So we may not have questions because we've heard it five times or, or by the end of this term, six or seven times, but it's your first time. Um, don't be afraid to ask those questions, even if they seem basic, even if they seem, you know, not, you know, that, that you should know the answer where you think you should, but you don't just ask the question because that's how you're going to learn. Okay, Anna. You'll be more effective if you learn the process or processes and work within them to make change, including making changes to the processes themselves. <laughs> Trying to make change without seeking to understand the process often gums up the works and doesn't lead to anything. Uh, Athena is an incredible resource in understanding those processes um, after you've tried the charter and the rules. Try those first. Um, and with that, just because something is how we've always done it does not mean that it is the best way to do it for the future of our town. And you'll make those changes best when you're informed on how those gears turn and how to move things through the system. Uh, Kathy, I wanna make sure you can hear us and we can hear you and we know you've joined the meeting and then why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, and I apologize for not being there. When I realized how late it was, I decided to do it from here rather than adding 15 more minutes to not being there. Um, I, I, building on what Mandy and others have said, I think the other resource you have is the rest of your counselors. Um, most of us are perfectly willing to answer an email, answer a text. So would you spend some time with me? I, I'd like to know more about what's going on or um, can you give me old documents? Um, I love to do that with people. So to the extent people want to um, reaching out, you know, I think most of us are very responsive and willing to share that time and uh, insight. Okay, Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. So I think I agree generally with pretty much what everyone has said. Um, but to add, I think for me, at least because I'm so busy and I think a lot of us are, um, setting aside specific time for council stuff has been really helpful for me in terms of organizing life because, you know, we get lots of emails, lots of communications, lots of documents to read and trying to just fit them in when they come in sometimes can be really overwhelming. So like setting aside specific time during my day to start digesting council stuff has been really helpful for me in terms of organization. Um, and another thing that I would suggest is that if there's an, an initiative at the council level that you're particularly like interested or invested in, um, trying to follow it as much as possible. Um, because what I've learned is that when, you know, there's a motion that I am particularly interested in and it gets referred to, um, the, another committee, and then I miss the committee meeting at, about that resolution, then it comes back to the council and then I'm missing information. Um, and it gets really repetitive. And so I know we're not always available for those things, but all the meetings are recorded. And so I think like, if you're particularly interested in something, I would suggest trying to follow it to the best of your ability. Um, cause that was something that I think I've learned over the past two years makes, um, advocating for and, making informed decisions a little bit more challenging. Anika, you said you had something else? I just wanted to add that um, Athena is one of the best assets that we have. Yes. <laughs> so are there questions from the people that have just been, yes, Bob. I'd like to add something. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've been on the finance committee for more than four years now. Learn the budget. <laughs> it's very important that you understand the budget and pick up the FY24 budget um, and look at it and read it and understand it because we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll be doing the budget again in over the next six months or so. So uh, it's important to know where we're spending our money and how we're spending our money. Okay. Lynn, can I add a couple of things before Please. we move on? Um, I, I'd like to second what um, Anna said about 
this being new and learning the process, but that we can change it. Um, there was a counselor, I'm forgetting his name, but he used to say, it's like building the plane while you're flying it. We're only five years into this and we're still figuring things out. It's George. <clears throat> yeah. It was Steve Schreiber. Oh, yeah. Um, but there is a, there is a lot that can be approved uh, improved upon, and it is a process, and um, you know it's going to keep going on after we're all gone. So I think um, being good stewards is a, is a, a great way of framing that. Um, and then Andy brought up SharePoint. <clears throat> I, I didn't want to get too much into the weeds in terms of, you know, how all these things work before you're actually seated. Once you have your town emails and your town devices and you're all set up with those, then we can start talking more about, you know, how you get information from us before meetings and so on. You're going to get sick of my emails very quickly, but I will provide as much information as I can before your first meeting so that you're well set up for that. Thank you. Okay. Other pieces of sage advice. I'll add one more. Don't put anything in writing you're not willing to see in the press because your emails are public, your text messages are public, and um, whatever else people want to ask for. Okay? So just remember it's all public. You are now in the public eye, and that makes a difference in how uh, you might want to express yourself. At the same time, I also strongly urge people to respond to emails, particularly from your constituents. Um, one of the things that I think I've noticed with the change in government in Amherst is people actually value the fact that they have a counselor, that they have two counselors they can go to and ask for assistance with some kind of issue. Other comments? Uh, Dor Dorothy just joined. Dorothy, can you hear us? Dorothy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there other questions? Hmm? I, I didn't hear you. Do Dorothy, um, we are using this time to offer, oh, and Shalini has just joined us as well, to offer the new counselors a piece of sage advice, lessons we've learned. And so would either one of you like to offer something up? Mm -hmm. Dorothy. Well, I would say turn off your overhead light, which I didn't have a chance to do yet. Um, uh, listen to your constituents. That, that's my advice. Um, and if you do something you think they want you to do, check back and find out if that really worked, if that was it. Um, so just keep an open mind on that. That's it. Shalini? Hmm, sage advice. Ah. Um, yeah, I would uh, agree with Dorothy about... Um, listening to uh, constituents, but also making an effort to listen to people who don't necessarily reach out to us and don't have means to reach out to us. Um, I found that expanding my circle of people that I listen to always gets me new insights. So expanding your networks, connections to hear from more people. Um, and I'm just going to anticipate um, offering the legislative process guide, which I wrote because it helped me to think through um, how to initiate new bylaws and how to create new bylaws, um, what to put into it, and how to engage people. And so hopefully it will make its way to your in your hands at some point. Um, um, and I'll, um, I can't think of anything more right now, but I'm so excited for you all. And it's a third town council, and I think you're going to be so much better than we were. Andy. So I was thinking about the question that is, um, has been raised about uh, responding to 
um, constituents and every constituent you hear from is very difficult. And I just want to reflect for a moment because I've probably been a town government longer than anyone else now who's in the room because I was uh, on the select board before and on the old finance committee and in town meeting. And just my experience has been that the reason that I feel the charter has been successful is that in all of those prior roles, I have never received the volume of direct feedback from constituents as I have as a counselor. And I value hearing from so many people in such varied opinions mm -hmm. and concerns. But uh, a lot of them come as uh, communications to town council that go to the entire council. And uh, making a decision as to whether to respond to one um, is a very difficult thing to get through. Um, so I would just give a couple of pieces of advice. And as a counselor at large, because in representing the entire town, I think it's even more difficult because I don't have district specific things. And I see and I know what's going on within all of the districts. Um, I don't, if I respond to a uh, general comment, I always start out by, I am responding as a single counselor, not on behalf of the council, mm -hmm. so that okay. it, that is clearly understood. Mm -hmm. And um, I usually do so to provide very specific information that I have that is relevant to the person's inquiry, um, but I don't make an effort um, and I don't know if my colleagues have the same view of it, but to respond to every uh, um, every comment we receive, you'd be at it. That'd be your entire lifetime. And I will just add, actually, one of the responsibilities that the council in their our first term decided that the president would respond to emails. And if mm -hmm. you ever read any of the responses that I have sent, they're pretty generic. And they basically thank people for the email. They tell them how they could post their comments so that they are made public because they are public documents. And uh, that's pretty much it. I'm once in a while, mm -hmm. if I know a certain meeting is coming up, I might include that. Um, and my personal experience with having that response sent out is that constituents, I mean, our residents really like it. They like to know that somebody has read their email and they like to know that they've been heard. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I just went because um, Andy did add that he's an at-large counselor and it would be impossible to, I think the at-large counselors to respond to all the emails, Please. but for district counselors, um, w you'll get a lot of emails from your district constituents. And like Dorothy said, and you know, everyone said, I always answer those and if, even if it takes a couple of days people understand and then when an um, email comes to the whole council if it's from someone in my district I will respond so I think if everybody gets a response from one at least one of their district counselors you know right. then, then they'll hear back in addition to hearing from Lynn and Lynn responds right away so they know it's been Sometimes. You do, yeah so you, they know it's been received <laughs> so that would just be I would say even if it takes a few days to respond and also since we don't get email lists from the town, we have to put our own mailing list together. So when we send out a notice of a district meeting, so I also, you know, if you look out for when emails come to the council as a whole to take down the email address of those mm -hmm. that are constituents writing in your district mm -hmm. and I, any way you can get email addresses. So when you're sending out notices of your district meetings, you're you know, to try and be sure you get them to as many people as possible. And even asking when you send out the notices, if people will send it to their friends and neighbors. And then when they come to the meetings, you can get their email addresses because I was concerned that you don't wanna just invite the same 20 or 30 people to your district meetings, but really be able to get the notices out to as many people that live in your district as possible. Right. Heather, I mean, hello. It's I'm all sorry. good, thank you. Now, is this an instance where if a constituent has emailed all of us, we do not hit reply all? Um, if you, uh, um, 
the president has been asked in the past, and I have done that, uh, to reply, and I reply all because I am not expressing an opinion. If you are going to get into opinion, you need to be careful about replying all. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't share information, but it's um, it's a it can become a slippery slope. Yeah, Pat. We're going to take this last one, and then we're going to oh. see if there's any more questions. Go ahead. I've been thinking about something that was said, and and I sort of realize I envy the at-large counselors because all people in town are um, they represent all people in town. I'm a district counselor. I represent my district. Um, and I try to listen to the residents of my district. Um, but <laughs> I try to listen to the people in my district, um, not, on, not relying on my assumptions or my preferences or my prejudices but to really listen and try to understand what's best for Amherst, what's best for all of the people, not just the residents in your district. If you care about affordable housing and your district is, for whatever reason, opposed to affordable housing, of course, nobody is. So we're not, we don't have to have that debate. But um, speak your mind even if the residents in your district are asking you to stop something. Take the risks to live your values, not your assumptions and prejudices, but your values. So please know what they are and center yourself in them. Right. Paul or Athena, did you have any closing comments for this? I'd like to thank you all very much for coming this evening. It's wonderful to see you in person. I really appreciate you being here and taking time out of your busy lives to be with us. Um, like I said, I'll be in touch with more information about getting your devices, doing your HR paperwork, getting all your certificates and signatures in for everything. Um, but even in the meantime, if you have questions, if something came up tonight or not tonight that you have a question about, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and those of you who asked to have meetings with me and or Paul, um, I'll try and schedule those with you as, as soon as we can make time to do that. But thank you all again. I really appreciate you being here. Okay. Paul? Yeah, so I <clears throat> want to build on that and thank you all for running and being elected. It's really an important job. Um, it's a hard job, though. And I think one of the hard things about it is that um, people think you have a lot of power, but your power comes from your vote. And the power of the vote comes when you have six other people who, or sometimes eight other people who agree with you. And then it's that's what drives the town. You are the chief elected officials of the town of Amherst, but that only works in this room when there's a publicly posted meeting and you, and you have a majority of your people, um, of your colleagues who vote with you. So learning to count to um, seven is important. <laughs> Okay, with that, uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, this was uh, purposely scheduled for with 15 minutes. And then at 745, we will convene uh, back as a council and do the state of the town address and then some action items that we have on the agenda. So if you're on camera, please turn your camera off. Please turn your voice off or your video, your um, uh, audio off as well because you'd never know who's listening. Thank you.
please uh, consider reassembling so we can get started. Did you say five minutes? Uh, this is like a two minute warning. Amazing. Take care, Hala. Because you got your, it's not activated. Hala. Yeah. As you return, please turn on your video. You're spreading out. Yeah. Right. As you return please turn on your video, but not your mic. Oh, this is your jacket. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Anna, you're here. Alicia, are you here? Are yes, you I am. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. Uh, Kathy, um, I'm sorry, not Kathy, you're here. Um, Michelle will be joining us, but she has something else that was going to come right up to 7.30 or a little bit later. So, um, Paul and I have committed to brief State of the Town addresses. <laughs> and with that, uh, I'm going to uh, reconvene and we'll ask, we're going to start actually with mine. That's, unless you put them together, you know. while we're queuing this up. This is the state of the town address for 2023. Both Paul and I are speaking tonight. And while you um, are not going to hear from the schools and the library as we have done in the past, their annual reports are in your packet, along with the annual report for the um, uh, Board of Licensing Commissioners. We are still waiting to receive the annual reports from the Housing Authority and the um, um, Oliver, Oliver Will Elector, right. So we're gonna go. Just, you can go two more slides. Thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, we wanna acknowledge um, the town council this is not a one person job. This is a 13 person job. And all of us have worked hard and contributed in many, many different ways. Uh, the counselors are listed up here in our wonderful portrait for this year, which actually is hanging in the lobby. Just to point that out, Mandy Jo. Um, and uh, our at large counselors, Mandy Jo, Andy and Alicia. And then district one, Michelle Miller, Kathy Shane. Uh, District 2, Pat DeAngelis, myself, Lynn Griesmer. 3, Dorothy Pam and Jennifer Taub. And then 4 is Anika Lopes and Pam Rooney. And 5, Anna Devlin Gothier and Shalini Balmilne. Next slide. 
one of the things we have to do every year is make sure that we fulfill the requirements of the charter. So I'd like to throw a few numbers in. One is that we had 29 council meetings at some point during this last year where we convened the council. That includes the four town meetings and so forth, but 29, no small change. We have four council committees. We have joint capital planning committee. We have the budget coordinating group. Each councilor that is a district councilor has participated in two district meetings so that we've had at least 10 district meetings, and I know we've had more. And we've had any number of public forums, some of them attached to different committees. For instance, CRC has had listing sessions uh, and so forth. And then we have eight committees to which our council is a liaison. And we should always point out and make sure that people are looking for and recruiting for people to serve on the planning board, the zoning board of appeals and the non-voting residents on the finance committee. Those are the three committees that we actually appoint people to. Next page. In addition, two people, two, three people have served on two building committees, uh, the Jones Library Building Committee and the Elementary School Building Committee. In addition to that, as we discussed just earlier during orientation, there's lots of communication with residents. And then I took the 21 proclamations and resolutions we did this year and did one of those little scramble things. I'd never done one before, so I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, but really important is we do a lot to ensure people's voting rights. Uh, we've made sure that we've ordered new, new machines so that we're ready when we finally can do um, ranked choice voting. Uh, we have approved early voting for all of our elections, local local elections and mail-in ballots as well. Next slide. This year, we've had a couple things out of the ordinary. For instance, we've held a debt exclusion ballot question for the new elementary school. We appointed three school committee members to finish out the terms, and we increased stipends for the next term. Next slide. We always work with an eye toward the town manager's goals because in fact, they reflect our goals. Next slide. During this year, we've also done a fair amount on bylaws where we've adopted and are revised. For the first time, the town has water and sewer bylaws and regulations. It took a long time to get there. I wanna thank Anna for one of her particular efforts in that way. Uh, we did flood maps. That was also a very long process. And that in fact informs up, or help, causes us to update bylaws. We did obstruction of public ways of snow and ice removal, specialized energy code, and affirming reproductive um, and gender affirming health care. And finally, after five years, the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee made sure that we finished up our bylaw review. Um, we sent a few to the town manager. They're still there. But Pat, thank you for your GOL leadership in making sure that happened. Um, next slide, please. Our policies that we adopted, one is a flag raising policy. Another is a public way policy revision. In this case, we've had a public way policy for a long time. We did actually do a surveillance use policy that allows for in, in cruiser video and audio. And we accepted the general mass, mass general bylaw chapter 98 paragraph 18b, establishing of designated safety zones for ways in cities and towns. And you'll be hearing more about that as we go into this next year. There are still bylaws in process, residential rental, waste hauler, solar, nuisance, streetlights, traffic calming, real property disposition. Next slide. And we have major capital projects. We have moved in significant speed toward the elementary school. We'll discuss the Jones Library renovation and expansion request for the bond limit uh, next week again. Uh, meantime, the North Amherst Library, due to the generous gift of an anonymous donor, has had a beautiful addition added. And we've done two things that deal with our wastewater and water plants. And that's the cent centennial water plant and gravity belt thickener. 
But you notice on the side over here, there's a to-do list. And that to-do list is someplace, some a place where we really need to focus our energies in the coming term. Uh, that's the DPW, fire and EMS, and our roads and sidewalks. Next slide. We have done some things to improve our public ways. Pomeroy intersection, the North Common is underway. Uh, the town hall front steps are about to be completed. And we've done a lot of approval of things like utility poles and under underground conduits, et cetera. I could not without, put, I couldn't go further without saying one of our serious challenges remains the North Amherst intersection. If I didn't say that, at least two counselors would say, you forgot something. So next, sli next slide, please. In affordable housing, one of our most exciting events and rewarding in this year was to at, be at the ribbon cutting for the East Gable studio apartments at 132 Northampton Road. That's something that though it, the council inherited per se, it became one of our landmark projects very early on. In addition to that, Progress is being made on the Belchertown Road East Street School property and with great excitement, the Ball Lane deed restricted home ownership property. We have purchased a site, a site for the homeless uh, housing, but what remains is how much is it going to cost and where will we find the money? Next slide. One of the things that we discussed tonight is the budget and we all really take it seriously to be good stewards of our fiscal health. And in doing so, that means that we look at our budgets, we look at our reserves, we look at our capital reserves and expenditures, and we have been very blessed in the last, two, last five years, actually, to have excellent audits as well. Uh, next slide. Under racial equity and social justice, we have had some serious achievements. We've had a few blips, uh, and we still have things to work on. So the DEI department is up and running. CRESS is kind of being rejuvenated with hiring going on as we speak. And the African Heritage Reparations Assembly has delivered their final report to us. Recommendations from that remain within our committees. However, we're still looking at issues like the Resident Oversight Board, and particularly how does that work with the new state laws as well? The Youth Empowerment Center and future AHRA recommendations. Next slide. We've spe we have filed some special acts with the state legislature. One of them is waiting for action for two terms now, and we're going into our third. It is ranked choice voting. Uh, a fee on transfer of property is another one, and extending voting rights to lawful permanent residents for municipal elections. Next slide. And there's significant legislation that we're watching closely and have testified on. One is the act of creating a municipal and public safety building authority. This we hope would help us build DPW and the fire EMS station. Another is two different types of pilot legislation. One is for nonprofits. That includes some of your private higher ed institutions. And the other one is reform in the state owned pilot program in lieu of taxes for state owned land such as the University of Massachusetts. And then also, as we mentioned earlier, fees on transfer properties. Next slide. Our, ch our challenges remain significant. Uh, our six goals are, we are one of the things that the council will look to do in the next term is hopefully classify those goals and the sub goals as either short term, long term or ongoing. We also have to deal with the ongoing development of responsible capital and operating budgets. One special feature this coming year is the Charter Review Committee. We have to appoint the people to that and they will provide recommendations to us. And then counselors and the public, we always are looking for ways to continue to provide, um, our, make our jobs more manageable, uh, to mentor for the future, both within the council as well as recruiting people to committees and then look to those people as potential and future counselors. Transparency and residential engagement. Next, last slide. So as we conclude, I know all counselors join me in thanking our town manager and the staff and particularly the clerk of the town council. 
Uh, we really want to thank all of the many, many people who serve on our town committees. That is a significant commitment. And we are blessed to have some really, really outstanding committees and people serving on them. Amherst Media has been there to help to um, show our meetings and provide tapes, et cetera. And we want to thank our residents. We hear you. We're hearing you every day. We ask you to submit your public comments and we pay attention to those public comments. We like when you come and make comments and visit us in the town room. So with that, I'd like to say just a big thank you. Paul, your turn. Thank you, Lynn. And one of the challenges on these two things is that we sort of go through this to the same well. Um, but so when I was working on, on this, I was thinking, I was looking at last Saturday, um, we took a break from shopping downtown because it was card day and there's 20% of everything downtown. Thank you, Business Improvement District and downtown businesses. Uh, we were getting a little boost at Amherst Coffee and a friend was there with his very lively three-year-old daughter. And he grew up in town, went to Amherst schools, went away to college and is now back in the area raising his family. Um, our conversation ranged from daycare to speed limits and speed humps to Friday night's Mary Maple lighting to the many resources the town offers to families like his, the Eric Carl Museum, Groff Park in the summer, block party, recreation activities, Kendrick Park, Kendrick Park playground, playground was a fan favorite with them. And of course the library. And after we were, talked with him, it made me think about the work that we do and why we do it. Um, I believe our mission is to create a place where children can grow up with a true feeling of community, including being safe and engaged, where each is launched into an adulthood, where they find a satisfying path in life, where values of equity and sustainability matter. And it's important that our community commits to this vision we hold for all of our children, not just those born to advantage. We need to be purposeful about our actions. So as town officials, we hope the legacy we leave to those who follow us will be more resilient and sustainability community, a place striving to be a more welcoming place, a community that embraces equity for all, and a place that has a new elementary school and library. Next slide. And next slide. So, is that the next slide? Okay. Uh, the state of the town gives me the opportunity to reflect back over the past few years to recognize all that we have actually accomplished. And um, and I think it's important for us to think about the, the major work. Um, and we have to talk about it because we have to remind ourselves of the good things that we actually have done. Um, we need to celebrate some of these uh, achievements to bolster our resiliency because these things can take a long time. So let's look at a few of the things in which we can rightly be proud. We should go to that. No, we're too, we're too hard. Go back a little. Should work. Yeah. The spray park at Groff Park, Kendrick Park Playground, the dog park. These are all things that happened under the council's watch. The North Amherst Library Edition, thank you to the anonymous donor the Pomeroy Village Roundabout, a newly repaved Northampton Road, the Centennial Water Treatment Facility. And what's notable about each one of these projects is that each was funded or is being funded in large part by grants, gifts, or a combination of, of both. And of course, our two major new projects, the school and the library, are being funded in large measure by grants from the state, along with significant funds being raised by the library trustees and others. The message here is we're making our town better and we're stretching the town's tax dollars at every opportunity. But beyond building things in, that we can look at, we're creating new town services that reflect our values. Our CRAS and DEI departments and the commitment to sustainability are just two of the examples. More symbolic, these, exa these departments are changing the way we conduct ourselves and how we tr treat each other and align our services with our values. Last month, I provided the council with 35 page report on the progress we, the town staff and others have made on the 65 goals the council set last year. It's long because it shows the true breadth and depth of work that we do every day. I hope you're proud of that as I am. Next slide. 
And yeah, so managing a complex nearly $100 million organization does not come without its challenges. In a tumultuous labor market, we are managing the inevitable turnover of employees and staff changes at every level of our organization. Change is always hard. This year has been especially difficult due to the people who we lost, but we'll continue to move forward with all of our initiatives. We had solid systems in place that are resilient to the, in the face of change. Our finances are strong because we have superb people doing the work, but it's also because we have excellent systems. I really wanna thank the people in the finance department who are muscling through this time period and they are very disciplined and professional at managing their budgets. Next slide. Now, all the initiatives I mentioned, new parks, buildings, departments are predicated on strong financial foundation, strict budget management and st strategic building of reserves, smart debt management and credible financial policies. These are the tools of success. Next slide. We plan for challenges, of course, and it's inevitable that we will have to make hard choices as we go. Next slide. As I've mentioned many times, our work is a team sport. We as a town have many partners in our efforts, our staff clearly, but also our partners at the schools and libraries. And I just have to say the commitment by our staff to the town is remarkable. Next slide. For the Forest Park, the town council established broad goals for the town manager, which I make sure to migrate to the entire team. We have organized our work to meet the council's objectives. You will see that reflected in the budget I submit and the work we do during the year. I really appreciate that the council took the time to set these goals. It really sets the tone for the entire community. Lynn already mentioned them, so we're, I'm just gonna click through what they are, which we, this is where we get a little redundant, but we'll jump to them. So next slide. Um, so in, cl in climate action, beyond the steps outlined in the CARP, our DPW and conservation departments are busy getting grants to address resiliency issues. Next slide. I wanted to highlight my commitment to the CREST department and seeing it to its full service level, which we're continuing to, to make progress on even without strong leadership at the top right. We have strong leadership, but it's a different type of leadership right now. We have learned so much just in this last year a new department takes years to establish itself and its role in the community. I am committed to this initiative. Next slide. And I must recognize the energy and tireless creativity of the leaders of the Business Improvement District and the Chamber. Working with town staff, their vision and energy have truly changed the game in Amherst. I know some of you were at the Mary Maple. Some people say it's the biggest and best in my estimation. So I want to also, while we have a minute, thank the UMass Band for being there. It's an amazing tradition that we that we bring up every year. And if you remember that three-year-old I mentioned earlier, she liked the horses. <laughs> and I wanna thank the university for working to finalize the new strategic partnership agreement. And I wanna acknowledge the contribution Amherst College has made to the library and so many other ways they have supported our community. These institutions truly are part of our community's cultural richness and vitality. I'd say our relationships with these three institutions are all under relatively new leadership has never been better. Next slide. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our nonprofit partners who we work so closely with, like Craig's Doors, the Survival Center, Family Outreach, Wayfinders, Valley CDC, the Housing Trust, who are all involved in advancing the mission of meeting the housing and social service goals of the town. And that little map you see on that, that's the ball lane development that is really, a a really groundbreaking um, project that's coming forward. Next slide. We are really fortunate to have a highly experienced DEI director to lead our racial equity and social justice challenges. She is wise, knowledgeable, and has a plan that will lead to change and success. And the work being done by Councillor Miller and the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, which was just recognized at the conference that she attended, is really groundbreaking. It's exciting to be part of this work. Next slide. As one of my colleagues in local government re reminded me, it's the frustrations and setbacks that we typically remember. We focus on the delays, um, diversions and recriminations. It's important to remind ourselves of the many accomplishments of which we can still be rightly proud. For those in the community who say we aren't going far enough or fast enough, I challenge you to point to another community that is doing more another community that is having these dynamic discussions and actually enacting change about race and climate, another group that is engaged in deep reflection about public engagement, 
another municipal staff who see their work for the town as their mission, not just a job, another police department that serves the town as well as ours does, another public school system where the students are fully engaged in making us proud, and one that you would rather, that we, another community where we'd rather send your children. We aren't perfect, I recognize that, but we're doing the work to make our community better. Next slide. So I appreciate the opportunity to serve you and the people of Amherst. I'm privileged to work with our incredible staff. I ask you to remember our staff during the holiday season and just say thanks if you see somebody. We are a 24 seven, 365 day a year operation. We're always on and ready to serve. Police, fire, EMS, dispatch are all on duty at all times, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year. We provide services around the clock with public works, ensuring our water is clean and drinkable. Our wastewater is treated and removed. Our roads are clear and navigable, and our parks are clean and available. IT, inspections, public works staff are on call at all times to address any needs that might arise. Town staff, excuse me, work day, <clears throat> work every day for the community providing needed services. And I appreciate the progressive, next slide please. Yeah, but the, and I appreciate the progressive intelligent direction provided by the council and most directly the leadership and guidance provided by town council president, Lynn Griesmer. You know, Amherst is an extraordinary community with farmers living next to artists, groups like Ancestral Bridges and Emily Dickinson Museum preserving our cultural history and down the block, you'll find a cutting edge scientist creating new paths for the future. It's a good town. And I thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, thank you. Thank you. And with that, we actually get to move on to evaluating his work. <laughs> um, so I'm going to place a motion on the floor and then um, ask for a second, and then I would like to explain one of the interesting insights that Mandy and Joe and I came to today uh, about this evaluation. Um, first of all, the motion is to adopt the 2023 Town Manager Performance Evaluation as, I'm going to say amended, because has presented in version five. There you go. Um, is there a second? Okay. Shane so, second. And Shane has seconded and several other people have. So Mandy, Joe, and I kept going back and forth about the opening paragraphs. And finally, we realized while both of us were going about it mathematically, we were doing different math. I was doing weighted averages and Mandy, Joe was doing modes. In other words, how often? And so finally, during a phone conversation today, we agreed to go with modes. And uh, that is why you got a version five in your version. And it means that in fact, for the town counselor's um, evaluation, he has been exceeded or met our expectations in 11 of the 13 goals. It was really an interesting, it was really, Mandy Joe kept looking at it going, what, what math is she using? And I'm going, what math is she using? So we got it. Okay. Are there questions or comments or additional, uh, Andy, you sent me something and I didn't know whether we caught it in the last version or not. Dorothy. Uh, I just want to say that the evaluation is a very technical document, but the overall feeling that certainly that I have is that I've been very proud to have Paul Bachelman as our town manager, and that I think that Amherst has been very, very lucky to have his intelligence, dedication, and service. And because we're asked to evaluate, we do. But we don't spend all our time saying, oh, he should have done more here. He should have done more there. That we, you know, we did that because we were asked to do it. And I think that most people are, are, or all people are very exceptionally happy with the work that you've done. And we look forward to you serving many more years. Thank you, Dorothy. Are there other comments, corrections, changes?
Andy? It wasn't a substantive, it was a grammatical, um, okay. an extra word. I, I did catch a couple of those. So if I'm uh, seeing no additional comments at this time, remembering that we are going to uh, be going into executive session and then coming back out, uh, I'm going to move to a vote, okay? Uh, Shalini Balmilton. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller is not here yet. Uh, uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. P uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It is unanimous with one counselor absent. We are now going to move on to the town manager polls. And I, let's hold off on, well, I'm going to make the motion, but we may actually then take it back because we may have changes. Um, to adopt the 2024 town manager goals as presented or as amended. Is there a second? Steinberg second. Okay. Pat uh, DeAngelis, you um, have been sharing GOL and GOL went about this, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. I don't have a lot to say. We um, took counselor comments. We took comments from residents, et cetera, and we reviewed the goals. Um, we had um, several items going on or ideas going on about aligning uh, town manager evaluation and therefore goal setting, et cetera, uh, with the budget cycle. That will be something that we take up um, next term. Um, we uh, made very specific changes, but there were also changes uh, presented to us by counselors um, where they were actually addressing policy and wanting policy changes that hadn't been voted on by the council. So those are not in there. Our job as GOL is to make sure things are clear and they're consistent and they're actionable. And if the council hasn't voted on something, it's not actionable. Um, so there are some counselors who will see their um, changes referenced in the document and other counselors that will not. If you uh, sent your work in late beyond the deadline that I had set, particularly by more than a day, your comments are not in there. Um, but you certainly can bring them up now. Jennifer, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think um, you covered it. Again, we were at, at GOL uh, really trying to be mindful of not introducing policy for the first time into the town manager goals. And we can take that up when we and then and count and all, when we discuss yeah. process. And also simplifying what the goals are, not just the checklist. Right. Um, Mandy Jo, you're also on GOL. Do you have any other comments? And Michelle is not here, and I don't either. But the floor is now open for uh, questions and comments. Kathy. Um, can everyone hear me if I talk at this level? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't, I don't have a mic, so I'm not. So I, I think you did yeoman's work, GOL, in, in improving and simplifying the document. So I'm just going to mention a couple places. Um, I still think it's too many items, but um, I'm not going to win that uh, uh, debate. Um, one of the problems I had, the challenges I had in evaluating Paul performance was I was also evaluating the council's to-do list, given the staff and resources we had, and said you can only do so much um, in one year. So my comments are just on a couple of items. Um, I marked it up, but some are just wordsmithing. Um, on the uh, housing affordability still seems to me to have many big vision pieces that can't can't possibly be done in a year. 
um, and in some cases are beyond the scope of what the town alone can do unless we bring in a lot of resources. So I, if we want to leave it this way, um, I think the last paragraph was the sentence was ensure the town uses state and federal funds to, to bring in housing and affordability. That's where our strength has always been. So if we need to keep all of this, I think that's okay, but um, I, I worry about it. And then um, one is again in housing, ensure the operation of a permanent seasonal year round shelter. We have purchased a piece of land um, and a building, but it's a big ticket item that we don't know the full course. So I would rather than ensure, which implies in the next year we'll get it all done, is uh, make progress on planning for. I'd rather change that word because um, it looks like we may even have waste cleanup. We've got demolition, we've got construction, and we've got operating costs. There's a lot involved before we get to a shelter. So it's more than one year. So that's my comment there. And then my other, in two more, in major capital investments, um, I don't think it was meant this way, but because it says bring the council request to set a location for the replacement of central fire station and begin schematic design. We don't say that for DPW. So it implies we want the fire station to go ahead of DPW. And from my visits to DPW, it's in, in it's at risk of falling down, not just in dilapidated condition. So I, I want to make it more even and just bring, we need a place for both of them. Um, and if we want to say schematic design, I'd say DPW first, but I would leave that term out. Then my last is more a uh, placement. Um, if you go to the relationship of the town council way down at the bottom, the very last part of it, number six, is advocate for and assist the council. And it's a very long sentence, but it's basically saying bring more money and bring more support into the town. I think that should be moved up to economic vitality. It's not a relationship with the town council. It's strengthening um the the financing of the town and the ability to uh, for us to provide services so i would just kind of move the whole thing up and you could put it just at the end of economic vitality um as as a because of what it is i i thought of moving it into finance but i think it's a stronger statement if we just move it up to vitality because paul just pointed out how much of big things we've done we're with getting outside money um, and there's more to be done. So I think those are everything else I have was, I think more in the minor. Um, I still think we could under management goals, collapse number one and two administration leadership and personnel management. I found it very difficult to separate them, but I don't have any specifics on this and that's it. Okay. I mean, um, that's, I, I, rifled through it, but I just tried to pick the things that I thought were more substantive rather than just could say it more simply, because um, I think you did a good job of simplifying. Thank you. And Pat, you're at this point taking notes. We also had the record of the meeting and we can um, try to do amendments tonight, or we can also bring this back to GOL and make changes in GOL and bring it back next week. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you. So I just have a couple of quick comments and they're all on the section for uh, community health and safety. And um, so some of just my feedback would be, I would like to see, I think number four says undertake a review of public safety protocols consistent with the council's November 14th goal. But I would like to see like the, uh, and I don't know if necessarily this is referring to exactly the same thing, but I would like to see the, like specific language on um, working with the APD to, to create um, a proactively anti-racist environment, um, which was one of the specific motions that was passed. And so I think that that also deserves to be directly put into the goals in that section. And then I just am wondering um, if I can get a, an explanation as to why developing programming for seniors was taken out. 
Like, is there a, a specific reason that we're not going to include that in that section? Pat, did either? Mandy Joe? Yeah. So when, when Paul asked us exactly what we were referencing with developing programming for seniors, it was more about the space for seniors to house programming than the programming itself is sort of what we had described to him. Um, mm -hmm. And so then the recommendation was to keep it within the, um, the capital investments of the senior center. So you see it in number five in, in major capital investments under seven. Okay. And then I want to go back to, and I just want to make sure we understand going back to the previous goal that you were on, on the November um, 14th, 2022 vote had about six or seven items in it. And so rather than list them again, in the interest of trying to simplify, we just left it as that. I, I think though, that there were a number of, like there was your motion that had a number of things, but there was also motions that I proposed that were separate from your motions. And so I'm not sure if we're including all of those things here. Um, so I, again, I think I would just like a little bit more specificity because it's not clear to me that the motion that I referenced is being referred to here. The question I guess is whether the motion you referenced was passed. It was, yes. Okay. Yeah, Alicia. Alicia, would you send me via email? Yeah. Please. Because we yes. meet this Wednesday. That would be really helpful. Yes. Thank you, Pat. I will do that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alicia. Was there anything else? Okay. Anna. Three quick comments. I appreciate Kathy's suggestion. Um, I would argue that it should go under finance instead of economic development because the broad range of the potential um grant funding um and, and where that could be applied i think it would be a better fit in finance because it's not necessarily only supporting economic vitality it, it also might they also might support other elements that everything is interconnected and so you know likely would support economic vitality but that isn't the focus of it um so i would agree with that but i would suggest moving it to finance um the second thing you know i I appreciate that the the work that GOL did, and I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this. One of the things that uh, came up a lot in my evaluation, and we've thought about it in a little bit with the the budget guidelines, um, is the idea of a, a staffing study and really examining our staffing levels. Um, it's something that I I think for me was reflected in the feedback that we got from town staff this year, and it's something that I'd really like to see the town engage in. I know that that's a serious study um, done on the heels of a compensation study. And so I'm trying to figure out, I don't know that it necessarily makes sense to put it in here directly, but um, especially since there isn't necessarily a passed motion on it and we're trying to stay out of specificity if we haven't passed a motion on it, I get that rationale. I'm naming it because I'm not sure when the appropriate time to bring it up as a motion is if it's not as part of the goals. So I'm, I'm placing that out there and if anyone has guidance for me, I appreciate it. Um, and then the second one was to Alicia's point. I think I was just reading under, yeah, actually, can you scroll down just a skosh more for me? Thanks. I don't know if you read my mind. Um, right there's great. So under personnel management, this is where we have the um, number five, foster a proactive anti-racist culture throughout all de town departments. Um, I don't know, Alicia, if I, I do think that it makes sense to keep it in Two, I don't know if you had suggestions for adjustments to the wording that you wanted to see, but I just wanted to note that that I think we'd started getting at this. I remember having this conversation last year, um, and I this is where we landed on placing that item, albeit a little bit more broadly than um, as you just framed it. Thanks. Okay, uh, Mandy Joe. Um, just two comments. Uh, I'll start with the staffing study. I think that could be potentially included in our discussion for financial guidelines later today um, as staffing relates to finances and budget. Um, and then to Kathy's comment about number six under the relationship to the council. So 
the state legislative action, a lot of that does go to finances and, and might belong in finances, but the special acts that we have asked our legislatures to follow, file are not really always related to anything financial, right? Choice voting is not, the voting rights of um, green card holders is not. And so this, this number includes both. And so what GOL was thinking was trying to sort of consolidate all of that state level advocacy that the council sometimes needs help with into one spot instead of listing it in I think when we were reviewing this, we found it in three or four different places. And so we were trying to move it into one spot. And that's, we, we settled with there because the council's the one that's sort of seeking the help with that advocacy. So along those lines, let me stay on that one and then go back to another one. Perhaps we could um, take the one that's on the screen right now and say something like relationship and advocacy with the town council. Um, it's relationship with and advocacy with the town council. So I, I'm just I I what we all want to make sure that that piece stays. It's the question now of where does it go. So that's just a, one thought. And then I want to go back up to the affordable housing. Under affordable housing. When I read ensure the operation of a permanent seasonal and year round or or year round shelter, um, I think we do need to work on that in a way that preserves our wanting to make sure that we have a year round shelter, um, that we have a shelter like we do, but also keep in mind that in fact, we have a very large goal ahead of us to put together a year round shelter. That's all. Um, Pat. Sorry. Yeah. Um, where is it? I'm sure the operation of a seasonal or year round shelter. If we take out the word permanent, we know that we're working on that. We've purchased the land, et cetera. So yeah. then we're talking about a seasonal or year round shelter, and we are engaged with credit stores and other organizations to maintain our unhoused population in the best way that we can. So if that were removed, would that um, address Kathy's concern? And Yes, it would address my concern because there's a big project pad. I didn't, I, I totally want to keep Craig's store going, but it was what I, I'm seeing as a multi-million dollar effort and can't be done in a year. Um, right. So, right. does that help, Pat? Pat, does that help? Yes. Thank you, uh, Kathy. You have your hand up. Yeah. Can you go back to this the sentence that I wanted to move? That's in the context of the council. And let Relate, me just. Yeah. So, here's one of what I was. Uh, oops. Yeah, it's relationship to council. To me, this is also a public document, and the council saying in a clear way. This is a relationship with the town council as opposed to the relationship manager and the town council with the town, that the council thinks it's important to bring money into the town. And if I had to continue my thinking, it would be to ease the burden on the property tax. That's where I'd be going. It's buried here is why I wanted to move it out of here. Uh, and Mandy, I understand what you're saying. It's not all about money, but a lot of what's in that sentence is talking about with an influx of resources, we could meet a lot of the aspirations more easily. You know, we're, we're forced into choices, whether it's infrastructure, building new buildings, um, repairing our roads, uh, moving faster. So I think it's buried because it's as if the main thing that the manager has to do is work with us to advocate. I wanted to move it up that we want to work together to bring these resources in. And I'm okay with it in finance, but the rest of finance is, um, and I'm on finance, is a little bit boring for the regular public. It's, you know, a solid budget, meet guidelines, do the budget every year. It's very process oriented. So I wanted to elevate it. So that was my only one of my reasons to move it, it's it's not just out of a business as usual 
and we talk about it all the time and we talk about it in guidelines. Um, so that, and I'm not going to belabor the point because it says everything I'm saying. It's just buried in a relationship with the town council rather than a relationship. It's the financial health of the town and the financial, and it's the economic vitality of the town that I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's, it's directly related to vitality requires uh, of financial health. So okay. I'll stop, but, but you look at all these things that we want to do, well, we could do a lot of the things we want to do better if we could bring in this, these kinds of resources. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments? Yep. Pat? Um, yeah. Anna asked the question about whether it was appropriate to bring up a policy change that would then get voted on at this meeting. Um, so when you were talking about not saying it exactly the way you meant it, I apologize. Um, well, what the heck Are you talking about the staffing study idea? Yeah. That wouldn't be a policy. Well, or an um, action. That it'd be an action, at, but at, which I think is why we were kind of going back and forth on in my head. And when I've brought this up before, it was, does it make sense to be in the financial guidelines or in the goals? And it's, it's kind of just the stutter start of where to go with that. Actually, Paul, I don't know if you have ideas on where that sort of thing might start. Um, I think the compensation study came from you. And so I don't know. Pat, does that answer your question? Because it's, it's not a policy that the. Oh, okay. Okay. Paul, did you want to comment? Just... <clears throat> So I think what you're referencing was, do we have enough enough staffing um, for the services that we're trying to provide? And the answer you will you've heard and you will continue to hear is that no, there's there's always a need for additional staffing. The challenge we have is that there isn't additional money to support additional staffing. So we may find that there is a need for additional staffing given that the um, goals that we're setting for ourselves, um, but there's, you know, we have sort of a zero sum game on staffing, adding additional staff at this point, or near zero sum game, I'll say. I hear that. I think when I reference a staffing study, I more, I think about it every time we get the financial indicators report and we see our operating budget. Um, and I, what I mean in a staffing study is really a comparison to, in terms of department size, like who's in what position in each department, that sort of thing compared to other towns with similar populations or similar budgets or however that might be. Um, for me, I think that's, it's, it's, I, we would always happily use more stuff, but um, it, for me, it's more of that kind of, where are we in terms of our peers in that way? Um, if that clarifies it. I think the way to approach that then is to choose a department that you and maybe do it department by department or choose a couple departments that we would focus on rather than the entire town. Okay. I'd like to, first of all, make sure that Michelle Miller, who has joined us, can hear us. I can hear you. Thanks, Lynn. Welcome, Michelle. Uh, we're on the town manager's goals. We're um, getting a feedback to the GOL committee, and uh, I'm going to call on Dorothy Pam. Well, there's a, in terms of staffing, there's an interesting um, conundrum, which was um, someone suggested to me that the town needed to have more staff in um, climate change resource recovery because there's so many grants that are coming now that you need staff in order to find them, locate them, and apply for them. And that if the staff isn't increased, lots of money, which we could use very desperately, will not come to us. So it would be spending money in order to get more. Um, and, you know, that was in the climate area. And I, I, it was presented to me a very interesting problem because I, I, I know that we have people working as hard as they can covering so many bases that um, it's just impossible to, to, to see all the grants and to get all those grants and to apply to all the grants because that's how we're going to be, I think, meeting the future. So um, I want to just go back on it because you you keep pursuing the question, is the time to bring that up in the goals or is it to, in the financial guidelines? And the two really are, are iterative documents that go back and forth. And so at some point, uh, probably at the point in time where we look at the goals and we uh, prioritize short-term, long-term, ongoing, 
if we see things in financial guidelines that need to now to be integrated into the goals, that would be a good time to do that. Because so that we actually look for a time to reconcile them. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I think I could kind of argue it the other way too. Yeah. I, I don't know that it necessarily makes a difference. It's kind of chicken or the egg here. As long as for me, it's more of, I'd like to see it reflected or on folks' minds as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Got it. Kathy? Uh, yeah, and when Anna talked more about it, it almost sounded to me like she wanted it to be an indicator. You know, when we do the comparisons with other things and we don't usually do that. So that might be something else to think about. I'm not suggesting, because I think it would be tough to do it, but to try to figure out a couple metrics that would say, you know, DPWs. We couldn't do the little departments. It would have to be the big, but it sounded like uh, compared to other towns, you know, how many people do we have working on certain things? And that's an indicator more than a staffing study. Um, it's, um, I think most towns feel like they're short staffed in multiple departments. Um, but so it's just a thought for whenever we come back to these uh, types of issues around staff. Okay. I'm going to go back to Pat and other people who are in GOL and ask whether you feel like you've gotten the feedback you need. Yes, I feel. Anybody else? I, I just, Athena, I was going to send you an email, and I apologize for taking the council time for this, but the town manager goals are not on the agenda for GOL on the 13th. They have to be. They, well, can they fit in the 48-hour rule? I just revised the agenda. Okay. Okay. So we do have a motion on the table. It was made and seconded, but we're we're going to come back to this on the 18th. It sounds like you want to withdraw your motion. I'll withdraw the motion. And somebody seconded it. Will you withdraw it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, I it, we're going to go on to the draft financial guidelines. And um, I, this is a discussion only. We're not putting a motion on the table. Uh, I will, in a moment, turn to Andy and just um, again point out that we have not had this discussion at all because of the jammed agendas. So with that, Andy, financial guidelines. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, try and go through the guidelines because they're a long document. And I assume that uh, or hope that everybody has had a chance to 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 read them and uh, think about what issues that they want to raise and ask about and then call it. i uh, asked members of the committee to join me. There are a couple things that I wanted to note, though, to begin with. Um, one is that. Uh, there was a uh, piece in there about uh, property tax. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of time actually in, at the very end of the process talking about property tax. And it has several different elements to it because on the one hand, we realized that property tax in Amherst is very high and continues to grow. And that um, our, when those of us who are out um, listening to a lot of uh, voters prior to November uh, election, um, hearing a lot from our constituents about their concerns about it. And um, so the, the question um, I think that we need to grapple with a little bit um, and haven't really um, satisfactorily is, uh, is our goal to... Um, decrease or control the um, uh, rate of increase of property tax, which we're doing by the two and a half percent per year, or is it to um, the goal to do more to augment property tax so that we can expand resources? And as you look at the questions of additional funding, to think about that, um, and one of the things that uh, Kathy pointed out to me when we were looking at it is by looking at the financial at that one chart in the financial uh, trend report from November, um, we were looking at a 10 year span. But Kathy did a lot of good work on trying to research 
the um, longer span of what has been happening. Uh, and so it wasn't just uh, fiscal year 04 to fiscal year 15, but it's really, um, uh, if you go back in a, a greater period of time, uh, it's even more pronounced than that. Uh, so that if you go back, or uh, I mean, I, actually, I meant, uh, let, let me restate that. Um, in, in fiscal, uh, well, I think you got the point that the, uh, the trend when you look over a longer period of time is more pronounced. And I think those trend charts are very important. There's a second thing I wanted to comment on which was that um, we received several comments from the public with, uh, through the um, email that went to all uh, counselors about ARPA. And um, the idea came up in uh, when we were talking about this as a committee that um, we haven't done what as much of what other communities have done around the state. And it's actually very consistent with the ARPA guidelines. And that is to think about um, one of our problems is that we really have not been able to keep up with our capital funding uh, needs. And particularly we get keep coming back to streets and sidewalks because that's yet another thing that all of us heard about. We're hearing a lot from constituents um, over the fall. And uh, the, uh, um, you know, ARPA was recognizing that construction costs inflated tremendously because of COVID. And as a result, um, they, the, the, um, Legislation from the from the national level looked at um, capital expenditures as being very much a permissible part and an encouraged part of spending for ARPA. And um, when I have heard from other communities around the state through my service on the MMA Fiscal Policy Committee, I found that most communities that reported back through that um, committee discussion process were reporting um, very significant focus on uh, capital. So this is not something that is pulled out of the air inconsistent with uh, the legislation, but it is a difficult choice because anytime you're spending funds, it's a choice. Um, the last thing that I wanted to point out just as an introductory piece, and then I'm really more interested in hearing from the council about what was written than talking, and that is um, uh, Michelle asked me to check on a number for her, and that is what is the current balance in the reparation stabilization fund? And um, I checked with uh, Holly Drake, who's our comptroller, and uh, she said that after we added the money uh, recently uh, with the uh, recent order, the amount in the fund is now $453,221, which is about a quarter, getting close to a quarter of the $2 million goal. So with that, um, I think I'll turn it back over to the president. Okay, are there comments or questions? This is, again, we're not going to try to finish this document tonight. This is to get issues out. And some of what you may wanna do is be sending those to Andy prior to the finance committee meeting, which is tomorrow. Uh, Mandy Jo. So yeah, unfortunately, Andy's gonna have to be able to read my writing because we didn't have a Word document to type our revisions in. So it's gonna be handwritten comments, um, but I will send them to you, Andy. Um, I'll try to go through some of the bigger ones quickly. Um, the on Starting on page two. Do you it, wanna, 
excuse me, do you want to put the document up on the screen, the, please? The sort of paragraph that carries over to page two that specifically identifies CRESS and DEI as part of essential ongoing services after a sentence that identified schools, libraries, public safety, maintenance of roads and sidewalks, and investments in buildings and equipment as essential services. Um, it worries me that we then identified CRESS, which is part of public safety, and DEI um, uh, with a, I, it's a question for the council or for the in interpretation of that, which does it mean that any of the departments not mentioned are not considered essential services um, and, and things. And, you know, in some sense, public health is a small department, but I believe we're required to have a public health department as part of state law, but I don't know. Um, and so I worry about listing some out and not others. Um, just a thought of a, a just a thinking about that as a, a finance committee. Um, I was gonna add in the next paragraph something about the staffing for securing, full securing of the IRA grants and seeking of them. Um, on the third, oh wait, nope, on the fourth page is some of my next bigger ones. Um, the third paragraph about increase, no increase in state aid. I, I think we should make a recommendation for what to do in the budget if state aid is increased from the November financial projections. We never talk about it in the financial guidelines. And I think we should talk about what our recommendation is, especially if that increase more than covers the projected deficit. Um, um, in the last paragraph before section three, um, uh, it would be good to know, and, and this is just a, a question I have, um, good to know what our contracts um essentially mean for what our contractual sort of what what part of this three million three point three million dollar increase in budget will be taken up by contractual salary increases um on the next page of page five are, hold on oh. andy are you able you're you're able to take the notes okay I, i'm going to send him my document okay thank too. you um Oh, wait, no, um, sorry, page six is my next big one. On the second paragraph, the maintaining services and all. Um, again, I thought that was a good spot to add, ensuring that the budget has enough resources to secure grant funds. We talk about the grant funds um, there. On page seven, a question about whether we wanna talk about school committee compensation in our, the budget as well as the counselor compensation um, and a specific request that the, the budget funds be included in the FY25 budget. We talk about it, but we don't necessarily make the specific request <laughs> there. Um, when the manager did his self-evaluation, this is sort of the next paragraph, he talked about how the departments are reaping the benefits of the solar landfill project, the solar on the landfill project in terms of budgets, but mm -hmm. we haven't really received any information as to how they are or where that benefit is. So I'd like something in this document to ask about um, a detail for how the departments are sort of reaping those benefits, you know, what the description of utility decreases are and where those decreases are now being spent. Um, something about that. And in this expenses for capital, um, again, in the managers, I think this was in the financial indicators, or actually it's been prior votes, the 5 million that we removed from stabilization, the Eversource rebates expected for the school project, the um, IRA rebates expected for the school project. I think these financial guidelines should put in w where we expect those dollars to go to be deposited um, so that we're clear on the, where money rebates like that for big capital projects should be deposited um, or if they have to go into free cash if they come where transfers should be made to to account for that money um and I, then on page 
of and page eight also has a paragraph about staff resources for grants. Um, and then if we're getting those grants again, where they should be deposited. And those are the biggest ones I had. I'll send you my whole document. If you can't read it, Andy, give me a call. Okay, thank you. Dorothy? Uh, just a small comment. Um, when, uh, amidst all of Mandy Jo's great points, um, she wondered, wondered why it in, uh, included increasing funding for uh, CRAS and DEI, but that has certainly been brought up at meeting after meeting and many, many hearings. Um, it, it wasn't listing what this person should get, you know, other, other agencies. It was just that this was an area where it has been identified um, needs increased funding. Um, and that's why I believe why it's in there. Kathy. Um, Mandy, uh, thank you for your um, excellent comments. I just have a question because I agree with them. So um, if we say, uh, number one, you had said if, if state aid comes in higher and we actually close the deficit, do we want to recommend what the town manager sh should do, or we could say he comes back to the council with a recommendation, um, you know, just in terms of, I think that's cleaner. Last year, as what I remember happening, Paul, was we just got it almost fatal. It was, it was done before we could talk about it. Um, and so everyone started counting their new money. Um, so I think it would be good to come back. And I just want to see if there's agreement on that. And then the deposit, if we get rebates on major capital projects, I had always thought they would go into the capital stabilization fund, but we never explicitly said that. So if you were thinking that's where they should go, that's what, what we should word it. And then the question is when what we do with it's not quite clear to me yet whether the North Amherst Library conversion to electric qualifies for anything, but it might, um, you know, depending, it, it's because many splits air source don't. Do we want this as a general policy or do we want it just for the biggies? You know, in other words, if the town succeeds in bringing in some ever source money or some incentive payment, does it always go in the capital or should we just make it this for this year? We we know the, the school is on the list for some fairly substantial money. So it's a question rather than a because I always thought the school related. I always thought all was going back into the capital fund, um, you know, as part of the uh, thing that made the school work. So those were my two. I think. I think I, I know you're sending them to us. I agree. I think what you were asking on the wage and benefit increases, how much of the increase in the total budget gets absorbed by the fact that just wait the fact that wages and benefits and meaning pension and health. And I think that would be a very good number to put in because we've only getting when I say only. The millions we're getting more each year are not that big, and most of them are going for labor. And it would be just good to make bring that fact into this document. It's not as much money as people think each year in terms of doing something new, brand new with it, unless we don't bring in resources. So thank you. And that would requ that requires the finance department doing it for us, Paul. You know, computing kind of across the board of if the total increase is this, how much. What is the total increase in wages and benefits in dollars? So we can figure out how to write that sentence. So thank you. Jennifer? Um, yes, let's see. We actually got an inquiry from the public, but it's something that had struck me in reading it also. And that was, um, I think when you're talking about applying for grants, it was like, a, I'm not sure if it was a cautionary note or discouraging perhaps, but to about applying for grants if it was going to, if they were for ongoing personnel or a program, which many grants are, because I would think we would want to pursue grant opportunities that support our programs, even if they would be, well, I, we wouldn't want to out of hand discourage it. I know it's part of the consideration. I mean, sometimes when you apply for grants, it's to start up a new program. 
but what's lost sight of is where, who's going to pay for that program when the grant runs out. But That's again, that was about. cautionary. It wasn't stating a policy that we would right. not want to pursue it. Right. Yeah. Uh, Andy? Yeah, no, I appreciate the comments so far, and I'm not going to respond to all of them, but I thought there were a few that were worth uh, bringing up. I think that Kathy's already talked about the school, um, the, the question of what happens with uh, any grants we receive uh, for uh, energy savings, for example, the, uh, um, and we had a very explicit discussion about that with the school because part of the recommendation from the finance committee that was acted on upon at the time, and I think it was with discussion at the council level, was that the first um, uh, amount that was taken from the um, stabilization fund, the capital stabilization fund to reduce the amount that would be asking for debt exclusion. Um, there was an explicit understanding in that discussion that the goal and the reason to do it was because we felt that that money was likely to be available and if it was available that it would be able to replace the fund and in fact we would be able to reduce the amount that we were asking the voters to approve in a debt exclusion by that amount of money um, with uh, because we felt that it was likely that it would not ultimately affect the capital stabilization fund that would be available for the two projects that remain to be done yet. Um, as far as North Amherst Library, I think it uh, uh, is going to be uh, important to apply for funds, but there is a uh, issue that will have to be considered uh, by the town manager, if not by the council. And that is that uh, since there was a uh, private donor who very generously gave the funds to sufficient funds to uh, do the work on the North Hammers Library, does the um, donor, uh, does it reduce what uh, the donor was asked to give or is it useful to the town for some other purpose? I think that's an actually a very difficult policy question. And I think the town manager would need to give guidance if that money came in. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk about because it is an important budget issue, and that is the um, school committee compensation and the same would be true for uh, the library trustees. Um, the problem that we had was when you go back to the charter uh, as Athena reminded us earlier this evening, always look at the charter first. And uh, the provision in there about compensation for other boards and committees, um, not the council because the council has a special provision, says that um, the increase has to be provided for in the annual budget. So if there is going to be uh, a uh, increase for uh, total compensation for any other elected board, that does have to be included in the budget when it's recommended. And uh, therefore, um, I think it becomes an issue that may go beyond uh, just saying that we need to think about it. I'm not sure if um, the suggestion is that the council actually wants to recommend that that amount be included and how that amount is to be determined. Uh, so that actually is a, uh, a good point to raise because it's very timely. And if you don't raise it now, you're a year away from being able to raise it again. Uh, so I just want to, uh, at least point to that is the significance of the discussion that may need to take place. Okay. Um, let's see, Kathy. Yeah, I have a just a quick, I, and I know Mandy raised this and Andy just talked about it. I, th I think we're facing a very tough year, um, the FY25 year. So I am 
very leery of proposing something that would be an added to the budget if we, so I'm talking about raising compensation for two other elected bodies. Um, I think if the council wants to have a discussion about that, we, we should, and we should think of it hitting not the FY25 budget, but the FY26 budget, where we, once we get a little bit of a sense of maybe uh, in our dreams of dreams, the state, all that income tax money the state is collecting will start to come back to us rather than just big surpluses. Um, and we'll have a less tight budget, but I'm really worried about the FY25 budget. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we, we're, 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 um, we're, we're losing the ESSER funds in schools where we've incorporated the four firefighters into the budget with some strategic uh, agreement money from UMass, but we, we have a big department we've added. So I think we need to, and we, we've still got some unsettled contracts, but all that contract, those contract settlements are now in, going to be in that year. So unless there's a strong feeling, I, that's one of the reasons it's not there, Mandy. We, we, we talked about it real quickly, just the council piece was in there and we need to make sure it's worded right, but we didn't go toward all the other boards because it has, it's it's literally asking for an ad in what I think is going to be a tough budget. So I, it, that's a comment rather and a strong opinion about it. But Mandy Joe, uh, because of what Andy said about the charter, which is why I mentioned it here. If the council, I think, is said it would come back to that discussion, mm -hmm. and so finance is supposed to be having that discussion as to whether to recommend to the council to increase the stipends of the school committee. But if we were to recommend that, um, if the finance committee were to recommend it and the council were to vote it, it needs to be in a budget to actually happen. And so my recommendation is to sort of put in the budget that if the council recommends X, Y, Z, that the guideline is that it should be included in the budget. That's not to say we are going to recommend it, but sort of that preemptively, if we if we vote that in April, well, our guidelines are now, and the, if the manager doesn't then put it in the May proposal budget, well, then they have to wait another year um, because we can't get it in the budget. And so I, I, my request is to put some sort of language in there that's sort of preemptive. If the council makes that recommendation, the manager should include that in the budget. That's not to say we will make that recommendation. Okay. Um, I didn't understand that, Mandy. I think that wording it that way makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to support that wording. Um, I also would like to point out that at this point, the um, library trustees do not receive any compensation. Um, Andy, oh, Alicia, you had your hand up. Um, I was essentially gonna say something along the lines of what Mandy Joe said, and I think she probably said it even better. So just second what Mandy Joe just said. Great, Andy, you had your hand up. Yeah, and no, I was just gonna point out that um, we really, ought to not postpone this discussion because the purpose of the guidelines is to assist the town manager. The construction of the budget is a complex process that involves um, meetings with all of the department heads and looking at all of the in, um, information that he can put together and then making very difficult choices. So while it seems like it's four months away, those are very pressured four months. And uh, it uh, uh, for us to wait until far into the process to ask that something be added um, is really not what the um, purpose of having the guidelines um, as early as they are, because we're really trying to give guidance that is helpful for the entire development of the budget, not in, in not late in the process. Okay. Um, Jennifer? Do we usually have like a, a public forum or hearing on the budget guidelines? I mean, no, we don't. A chance for the public to, so they can no. offer comment. 
we don't do a special one. We we do have our uh, budget here budget forum that was back in November, uh, but we don't have one on the guidelines. So could the public comment on? They certainly can comment on anything, but in a in writing they won't. Absolutely, absolutely, and some have. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, Andy, do you have what you need and do other members of the Finance Committee feel they have what they need? And again, the Finance Committee is meeting tomorrow at three o'clock. No, when are we meeting? I think it's one. It's, a, it's a one o'clock tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I have uh, the yes. uh, what was said this evening and that was very helpful. Um, and uh, I will report it back to the committee and the committee will try and work with it to develop the next round of guidelines. Um, when it comes back to the council again on the 18th, um, at that point, I really think we're at a, at a stage where uh, the council ought to just be saying, be going through the process that we do with everything else that it is moved to adopt something and then uh, amendments are proposed to the item that's being adopted and we vote on the amendments as a council because um, it needs to uh, it needs to be a council guidelines and uh, the 18th is when that is really um, hits the road as I say. Okay. All right. Um, let me just um, mention a couple things before we go into executive session. In your packet is a draft agenda for the 18th. I personally look at this agenda and shudder because of what's on it and the length. So I specifically want counselors to look at it and understand what will be expected of you to come to the council meeting this next time. For example, on it is a huge piece of work that was done by GOL over the last year regarding rules of procedure. And most of those, I think most counselors just say they that's fine, but some of you may wanna discuss. And so they'll need to get pulled off of consent. The other things that are on that agenda um, include the possibility of the rental registration bylaw coming back if it gets through CRC this week. And um, the other is, we're not sure about ARPA yet, so that don't, don't even look at that. It's the Jones Library Authorization and the financial guidelines, which we just discussed, the goals, which we just discussed, the rules of procedure, and then um, the legislative guide, which in that case would be a referral to GOL. So it's not a vote to accept at this point. Um, so I just wanna point that out. Yes. I am going to want to pull the rules of procedure off the consent agenda. I don't think it belongs there. So I think okay. that we have to assume it, I will pull it off that night. So we might as well just get it off. Thank you. Okay, Kathy. Um, I, I would really like it if we could agree that rental won't be next Monday to give us time. Um, I know, Mandy, you're meeting on it tomorrow, but I think it's it's the same issue that I raised when I asked to try to postpone it to another council meeting. I think it needs to have time for a longer discussion, Lynn, and the 18th, we're not going to have time for it. Um, so if if we could agree, I don't mind it coming back, but maybe it can come back to the first meeting of the council in January, um, which would give us time to discuss it. I And I, I also saw a note that the work on the nuisance uh, bylaw, um, if there are changes in that, it might require amendments to the rental permit bylaw. So I, I'd like to not have this keep coming back next year. You know, so I, I just, would like a fuller picture. So I'm suggesting um, 
that it not be on the agenda, particularly so that the people who want to come and talk to us about it won't all be there in the room um, if um, it's potentially a second reading or of a revise. So it's it's a suggestion to move it. Okay, thank you. Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Athena if she has any notes that indicate whether the motion had a date specific on the uh, postponement at the last meeting of rental registration. We we referred it to CRC, Andy, instead of postponing it. There was a discussion about uh, not taking Thank it you. up until January 8th, but that was superseded then by a referral back to CRC. Thank you. Okay, Mandy Joe, did you want to discuss this, please? Thanks. So... As chair, I requested that Lynn put it on the agenda in case CRC finishes with its referral this coming Thursday. I do not know whether CRC will, but the council agenda needs posted basically before CRC finishes its meeting. Yeah. Um, so I would request that it remain on the agenda pending CRC's outcome because I cannot guess what CRC will do with it on Thursday. It may finish its work it may not finish its work. If it finishes its work, it may request that a second reading happen, but it may also recommend that a second reading not happen on the 18th. I don't know, but the agenda for the council meeting needs posted before CRC's meeting finishes. Okay, that's what I needed to hear. Uh, Shalini? Um, yeah, I think you can uh, you can definitely send it to uh, send the legislative process guide to GOL, but according to what Athena informed me, that it's not a a bylaw or a or a policy, so it can be just voted by the town council. And it's a living document that's going to be, you know, it's open to be used in orientation for new councilors and for town for the town council and the committees to use as they please. So it does not need to be sent to the GOL. Um. In a previous discussion at GOL, um, at least two of us felt it should be looked at by GOL as it relates to the, anything that might change in the rules. But, I mean, I understand it's, a, it's not a document of you must do, it's a document of guidance. Mm -hmm. Anna? But to that point, if someone wanted to make a rule change based on something they read in the process guide, they'd have to bring that specific proposed rule change to GOL. That's so correct. I don't understand why the process guide would need to go to GOL because it in and of itself is not a rule change. Exactly. So can you- This conversation should be at the next meeting. Yeah. I think we're getting Thank more you. away from scheduling Thank and more- I agree. The okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to make the following motion and just to, um, Athena, I just want to check. We're going to move to a different Zoom, right? And then we're going to come back to this Zoom when we reconvene, unless the council. If you want to reconvene tonight, then we'll use this same one that we're on. If you want to wait and vote on the 18th, then we can do that on the 18th in open session. But if you'd like to reconvene tonight, then we'll use this. Like I'd I'm going to ask, is there anybody who feels passionate that we need to reconvene tonight? It'll save us time. It'll be one vote. Okay. Let's just knock it off the calendar off the agenda for next let's not add anything else to the agenda okay all right uh we're going to reconvene so the motion is as follows to convene so let me just explain before i make this motion you're going to go off this zoom athena meantime will be sending counselors only a new zoom that is an ex and paul will be leaving the room okay paul's, paul's going to send a zoom link for us because i need to stay on this one for the public. Ah, got it. Thank you. Uh, me And for the first part of the meeting that we're going to have, Paul will not be with us. And the second part of the meeting, Paul will be with us. Then we are going to come back into open session and we are going to log back on to the Zoom that we are on now. Okay. 
All right, with that, I'm going to make, yes, absolutely. As we get out of executive session, if maybe um, Athena can resend the yes. reconvene link, because I don't know where mine is. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We will ask Athena to resend to counselors the public link for getting back on. Thank you. Can we, Lynn, may I ask that we take like a five minute recess after you vote before we convene an executive session? Because it'll just take us a minute to re. That would be fine. Thank are you. there any other things that people want to make sure we understand or are going to do? Okay. All right. To convene, I'm making a motion, I'm looking for a second, to convene an executive session for the following purposes, in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Paragraph 21, in Prince A2, A, in Prince 2, to conduct strategy, strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel town manager Paul Bachman, in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Paragraph 21A2, to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel, town manager Paul Bachman, the town council will reconvene an open session following executive session. Is there a second? Second, Dublin Gothier. Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do have to vote. Okay. Are there any other questions before we vote? Okay. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Dublin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Okay, before you log off, I want to remind people that when you are in executive session and you are in your home, there cannot be any other people who are in, listening in on the meeting. Okay? Any questions? It was unanimous. We're going to go into executive session. Thank you. We're leaving this one. We're leaving this one. I'm sorry. Just to vote what we do in executive mm -hmm. We're just taking a short break so we can switch over.
So we are now reconvened in regular session. Uh, I am going to ask the clerk to read a motion, which I will make, and then look for a second. Sorry, did you want me to read the motion? from executive session? Please. Uh, that was to grant a two-year extension and if non-union employees receive higher than a 2% increase, match the increase above 2%. That motion is now made. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Okay. So just to explain to the audience so that we have met, we have just met in public, I mean, in executive session, we have now returned having uh, discussed among just counselors uh, with the clerk present and clerk, clerk of the town council present. And now, and then we've talked with um, town manager, Paul Bachelman, and the motion that is now on the table extend, would extend his contract by two years. That would extend it to August 31st, 2027. Mr. Bachelman already receives an automatic 2% cost of living raise because that is what non-union people received this year. And there is a pending discussion about a, a poten potential additional raise for non-union members. Right now that discussion is around one and a half percent. And we have also moved that if that is granted to non-union um, employees, uh, the town manager would automatically also receive that additional one half percent or whatever percentage that is. And so with that, I'm going to ask counselors if they have any questions or comments. Okay. Pam. Yes, I don't know if this is the opportunity to say so, but I really appreciate Paul's leadership and guidance and want to say thank you. This is the opportunity to say that. Are there other people who would like to comment? Yes. Kathy. Yes. The um, If if we could keep you for even longer than two more years, we would at this point, Paul. We, we, we um, appreciate your steady hand on multiple complicated issues and your enthusiasm. So thank you very much. Dorothy. Um, well, uh, I appreciate your leadership, uh, your intelligence and your energy and your, the fact that you really love to get up in the middle of the night for any kind of big fire call, uh, <laughs> but he does it. Um, so we, we really, we really count on you. Thank you. Jennifer. Well, Dorothy said what I was going to say, cause it happened in our district, but, um, on, I think it was a Sunday morning. I got an email as. I think Dorothy and Lynn did. It was about six in the morning and Paul providing an update, unfortunately, on a tragic, could be a tragic situation. But when I read it again, I realized he had been on site at 3.30 in the morning. So um, overtime doesn't even <laughs> begin to describe uh, the hours that Paul works, but thank you for your dedication and all the hours that you give to the town. Pat. Um, when I was younger, um... I had a theater teacher come in to work with my dance company and uh, she became a lifelong mentor. 
And one of the things that she said after every session uh, in the studio, she would say thank you to each one of us as we left, thank you for your work. And I've said that to you, I've said it to some other people too, but I want you to know how deeply, um, how deeply I feel that, both because of the work you do, but because of what that phrase means to me in terms of that relationship. So thank you for your work. Shalini? Yes, I also want to echo all the statements that have been made. And Paul, um, you've been here with us since our very first town council. And um, so I just feel, even though I'm not going to be a counselor anymore, I'm going to continue to thank you as a resident. And it is so clear how much you care for a town, for the people, and You've just brought such a balanced perspective, guidance, leadership, um, and I really admire you for that. And thank you for that. Okay. See you from the, on the other side. <laughs> well, now wait a minute. Well, that was quite a statement, Shalini. The other side. Uh, are there any other comments from counselors? Paul, I think we just really want to say thank you. Uh, we hope that. This is a vote of confidence. It's a vote of saying, hang in with us. Uh, the best is yet to come uh, as we keep uh, building new buildings and um, accomplishing all the many other goals uh, that we are here to work with you on. So, um, and for those of you that have often been in Paul's office and you all have, you know, he has a speaker on. So he's following those calls that come in on 911. <laughs> which is just astounding. Um, anyway, uh, with that, I'm going to bring this to a vote uh, and I'm going to start with Mandy Johannigan. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Topp. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Chalini Balnum. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. And it is unanimous. Thank you, Paul. I'd just like to thank the council, your, your kind comments tonight, but also the um, crucial comments that you've given me during the performance review, which is really important as we move forward. But the, I mean, I love working for the town. It's a fun town. It's, you know, I talk to my colleagues and it's, Nobody has the stuff going on that we have going on. It just makes it really interesting. So I appreciate everything that you do, but also that everybody in the town does too. So thank you. I will be uh, finishing up a press release that uh, we put out tomorrow and also working with then with the town attorney to make sure that the amendment to his contract is done. Uh, and with that, unless there's any other comments, the meeting is adjourned. And it is 1027, not 1227. Thank you.